I went in the batting cage after I went like 0 for 4 in a game. Went to the batting cage, started hitting off the tee, trying to figure out my swing and stuff. Our hitting coach, Tramel Sled, she was now the assistant hitting coach for the Cubs. He came in there and he was like, put the bat down. Like, put it down. Um, nothing's wrong with your swing. We watch as much video as you want. Nothing's wrong with your swing. He sat me down. It's like, I want you to go home and read about the law of attraction. Like, all right. And he asked me, he's like, what do you want out of this? Like, do you want to go, do you believe you're a big leaguer? Like, do you honestly believe you're a big leaguer? And I was like, yeah, I do. He's like, I don't think you believe it because you're not, your attitude's awful and you just don't trust yourself. And so I went home, read about the law of attraction and read about it, watched videos on YouTube, watched Will Smith talk about it, watched Jim Carrey talk about it. And pretty much what it said was, if you like, if you see it in your mind, you'll feel it in your hands. Or if you throw it out there, what you want, if you truly believe it, it will come to you because your mind is so powerful that it'll do whatever it has to take to get there. Have you ever heard the phrase becoming the best version of yourself? Yeah, me too. But what does that even mean? And how do we become that person? I'm here to help you navigate through those questions and come up with actionable steps in order for you to live your best life. We've got to discover what we want. We've got to figure out a plan on how to get there, and then we have to go. We can't just sit and wait any longer. Life won't wait on us. So come join me on this constant journey to become the best version of yourself and to find your best you. I'll see you on the other side. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Nick Carrier's Best You Podcast. Today, I have an absolutely fire interview, uh, and I'm stoked to say that Kyle Farmer, a utility player with the Cincinnati Reds, is with me today. Kyle, I appreciate you uh, spending the time with me today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Well, as I said, Kyle is a utility player with the Cincinnati Reds. He plays just about every single position, has played almost every single position, first, second, shortstop, third, catcher, uh, even pitcher a little bit. Uh, I think outfield is the only one he hasn't quite played yet in the MLB, but he might even play that a little bit this upcoming upcoming season. So he's a jack of all trades and super skilled guy. And it's a special interview for me because Kyle actually went to the same high school that I did in Atlanta, Georgia. He went to Marist School and graduated four years above me. And he was somebody that I looked up to when I was in high school, uh, even though he probably didn't know it, but I looked up to him as a uh, playing baseball as a football and baseball athlete myself as well. So super stoked to sit down and have a, a great conversation with him. But basic, basically, Kyle, the way I want to start off today is when did you kind of think Major League Baseball, I actually, this could actually be something that I go do? Because I, I think a lot of young kids have the dream of going to play Major League Baseball, but then all of a sudden there's kind of a real, realization point of, okay, this, this probably isn't going to happen, or I actually have a chance, I'm going to give this thing a go like when did that kind of happen for you um I mean you know growing up like you said every kid has a dream of playing professional baseball and making it to the major leagues but um I kind of came to the thought when I was probably a sophomore in high school that like when I started getting letters from colleges and and like SEC schools ACC schools I you know I always wanted to go to college and play professional, I mean, play college baseball in the SEC. And that's why I chose Georgia. But that was like my goal at the time. And I didn't really have like a goal of making it to the major leagues. At the, that was like the dream. But like my goal at the time was to make it to college to play baseball and to make a, get a scholarship. And uh, until my senior year, there was a few uh, baseball scouts that came around the games, you know, like the, I think the Pirates, the Marlins, the Cubs, some people like that. And they, they would meet me after a game and ask me like, Hey, how much would it take you to sign? And, uh, I said, gosh, a million dollars. And they looked at me and was like, all right, well, uh, we'll just, you might hear from us, but don't, don't count on it. And I was like, all right, that's fine. I kind of figured that because I wasn't a professional caliber player in high school at all. I had no business signing out of high school. And uh, I, my goal was to, to make it to college. And then probably my sophomore year, going to my sophomore year, I thought to myself, man, I could really, I could really get drafted and play professional baseball. And then that, I had that in my mind. And then I, I went along with it and got drafted my junior year. And then went, then I came back to school for my senior year and, and got drafted again. Yeah. So when that, when you were drafted your junior year, I think the 35th round, 
What, was there a particular point in the draft or a particular like dollar amount where you were like, if I go at this point, I'm going to go. If I don't go before then, then I'm not going to go. Like, how, what was that decision point? Yeah. So I, I, had, a, I had an agent and he did a great job with me. Um, but I had like an ego going into the draft my junior year. Like I thought I was the best shortstop in the country and I thought I should have gone in the top, top three rounds. And uh, my numbers said it and everything like that. And I compared myself highly to other players in the SEC. And so on the draft day, I saw all these guys going before me. And I was like, what the heck, man? Like, this is unreal. Then I get a call in the fifth round by the Reds, actually. And they wanted to take me. And for like $150,000, and I said, no, I'm going back to school. So I turned that down. The Yankees drafted me at 35th um, just as an honor, which was great. And I appreciate them doing that. But um, they, you know, I, I just had an ego and I wish I had someone had told me money doesn't matter because my senior year, I got drafted by the Dodgers in the eighth round for $40,000 and I had to take it because I had no leverage. And so I just would wish somebody had told me, which they probably did, but I ignored them that money doesn't matter where you go. Everybody gets the same opportunity once you sign. And um, it doesn't matter if you make a six, sign a $6 million contract or a $40,000 contract, you know, so many people can make it up. It's just, having the opportunity to do it yeah so when you went back for that senior year of baseball was there anything that you felt like what that you learned that was really important to learn that senior year of baseball that you hadn't learned prior that was important like going into the minor leagues uh gosh that's a good question because you know they drafted me as a catcher and so I never caught before and so I didn't really know what to do about that I just kind of learned on the fly but it was more a mental thing for me in my senior year you know I, I kind of the pressure was off of me because I knew I was going to get drafted at some point and I didn't matter what round I, I just tried to stay healthy um, but I just enjoyed the game more enjoyed my friends more enjoyed my time at Georgia and um, not I didn't have so much pressure on myself I think that that really showed me that um, you know there's more to life than baseball and I, and I saw that and I think that made me a better baseball player and have a better outlook on the game and in life. Yeah. So as we've mentioned now a couple of times, you played shortstop in high school, you played shortstop at Georgia, you get drafted as a catcher. When you get drafted as a catcher, were you like, what, what's the thought process? Were you mad that you were drafted as a catcher and not a shortstop or you were, you were you just kind of like happy to now be drafted and you're making that next step moving forward? Uh, both, honestly. I mean, I was happy to get drafted by the Dodgers and I, you know, I love catching. I love watching catchers in college and profession. I love what they do. And so I was pretty excited for the new challenge, but I also was upset that I was like, man, I can, I'm a really good shortstop. I can, I can play with anybody like that until I signed, I went and caught and I saw some of the shortstops that were playing. I was like, okay, I, I get it now. I know why I'm not, I'm not playing shortstop. I mean, you have like, um, Dominican Republic shortstops, um, Puerto Rican shortstops who are just unbelievable. You know, their range is out, out of this world. And it, and I saw, I was like, okay, that makes sense now why I'm a catcher and not playing shortstop. Um, cause they have a lot more mobility and range than I do. Um, so I learned on the fly catching my first time ever catching was the first game in rookie ball, I walked in the locker room, I was hitting third catching and walked in the manager's office and said, I've never done this before. Cause I know, I just want to see what you can do. Walked out the first inning, shin guards on backwards. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so I get back in the dugout. Our manager was like, hey, you got those shin guards on backwards. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. All right, sweet. So I, I woke up the next morning, caught all nine innings, woke up the next morning, and was sore from head to toe. My body had never gone through that before. And I questioned. I was like, man, I don't know if I want to do this. And But I stuck with it and enjoyed it. And it was a grind. I, I had a great staff um, with the Dodgers. Uh, our catching coordinator, Travis Barbary, had a lot of patience with me and taught me well. And um, it was it was a grind for sure, but I enjoyed it. Yeah, you know, you said kind of like right away when you were really sore after that first game, you're like, gosh, I don't know if I want to do this. And you probably had that thought process later on. Was there ever that like turning point where it was like, okay, like catching is the thing that I have to do. Like, and you, and you didn't have any of that self-doubt anymore about whether or not you were going to stick it out? Like, did you ever have that moment where it was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, um, 
man, the, the mind is such a strong thing. Um, I can go into this in the huge details, but like I'll start off with the earlier, earlier part in my career, like in, the, in like the low A and high A. I mean, I, I had to, yeah, I mean, I had to buy into it. You have to buy in to make it to the, to the big leagues. I mean, minor league baseball is not easy for anybody. And if you don't love the game, then you can't play minor league baseball. Um, the guys that are mentally tough and can grind through it, grind through the bus rides, not eating right. And those are the guys that, and learn how to, and know how to accept failure and learn from your failure. Like those are the guys that make it to the big leagues. And that's what I had to do. Like catch, I'd never done catching before. So I had to learn from my mistakes more than I learned from my victories or anything like that. And that's that taught me, you know, how much failure you can learn, how failure you learn from. and. I just, it was a grind for me. I had to, yeah, there were so many times where I wanted to call it in and I called my dad and dad, I don't know if I can do this. Like, I want to go back to infield. He was like, no, man, this is the spot you're in. Like they put you here. You gotta, you gotta do it. And, um, luckily I had a great support system. You know, my wife, Courtney, I was dating at the time and, um, she helped me out a lot. And, but it was, it was definitely, it was more mentally tough for me than physically tough because I never done it before. There were sometimes I didn't want to do it. And so I had to just keep battling through it. And it was, I mean, it was tough, but I'm glad I went through it for sure. Yeah. So you, you mentioned your dad and I know he was a he was big role model for you now and, and growing up. He always threw you BP and all that sort of thing. And they were there for your your first at, your first game and the walk-off hit. And he got that, that ball and your first home run ball I saw as well. So that's really cool. What do you think is maybe one of the biggest lessons that your dad taught you growing up? Um, you know, my dad never put pressure on me to play baseball. He wanted, he wanted me to be happy with whatever I was doing. If I wanted to quit baseball, he would have been totally fine with it. Um, but my dad, he, he's one of the hardest workers I know, you know, he got his, we weren't, we were on a family business. My, he runs it now, but real estate signs, my grandfather passed down to him and he grinds every day through that. And growing up and watching him wake up at 6am and go work till six in the afternoon, it really, it really showed me that what hard work really is and, and how to, you know, work hard and you can get the benefits from that if you work even harder. Cause I mean, he, he spoiled me to death. He was there whenever I wanted to, um, he could have easily said, no, I'm not throwing batting practice to you, whatever, or I'm not playing catch with you, but you know, he was there for me. And I think the two things he taught me was work hard and to um, always respect the game and respect each other and respect other people because that's what he does and that's what I try and do. And, and um, it goes a long way when you, when, A, you work hard and even more when you respect others and respect other people and what they do because if you respect them, they're going to respect what you do. And that's that's a bit, one of the bigger things he taught me. Gotcha, cool. Um, so I think that there's probably a lot of really tough things about the minor leagues. You don't get paid a whole lot. You're on the road a lot. And you don't know when you're going to get promoted or demoted or anything like that. It's just tough all around. But one of the things I was thinking about the other day that I thought would probably be pretty hard is the fact that you, I feel like you build relationships pretty quickly, but then like either you get promoted, you get demoted or they get promoted or demoted or something like that. And you lose that person who's there by your side that you've already, that you've just built that relationship with. So did you find that that was one of the, hard things about being in the minor leagues, like building a relationship with somebody and then kind of as quickly as you built it, then it goes away. Yeah, it's even, I mean, when they go away, it's even tougher, but it's even tougher having friends that play the same position as you and you do well and you get promoted while they're sitting back. And, but like, I've got some best friends that I've played with that have actually played the same position as me. And, um, there's a, like a competitive respectfulness, I guess you could say, like yeah. you want to beat them out because you're trying to make it to the big leagues, but you're also friends with them and you're going to help them out. Um, but it's also being golly, that's a good question. I haven't really thought about that, but cause I, I, I like everybody, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't hate anybody. I love everybody. Like they're my brother. And, um, I've like, I'll give me an example, like, um, Austin Barnes, who was a catcher for the Dodgers when I was there, like he was a very good catcher and he was in my, he had my job and I wanted to take it from him, but he was helping me almost to get better as a catcher so we could help the team, you know? So 
I think um, that's a different aspect. That's an aspect of it. But like you said, um, like leaving them, like, so I was in high A, got bumped to double A, and all my good friends were on the high A team. So I had to create a whole new friendship with the other team. And that's tough, but that'll also teach you, you know, that's like life too. Baseball is so much like life. You're going to make friends wherever you go, no matter where you are. And um, you got to learn how to deal with it. You got to be like the biggest piece of advice I got was you have to learn how to be comfortable in the uncomfortable. And so every situation I'm in is uncomfortable, but I'm comfortable in it because that's where I've, I've always been for the past six years. So do you think that's kind of, do you think that's kind of how you get comfortable being uncomfortable is just being kind of immersed in that uncomfort level so much to where you get used to it? Or how do you, how do you think you actually get comfortable being uncomfortable? I think just putting yourself in different situations. Um, like, I mean, when I got drafted, um, first thing I went into was a locker room full of Latin players that knew no English. And yeah. so I had, I was super uncomfortable. Like that was the first test for me was going in there and I was searching out the one of the five English speaking guys. And um, I learned pretty quickly that this is going to be very uncomfortable. And so I, learn through that, you know, high pressure situations and games and practice, like those are uncomfortable positions, but I learned to get comfortable in it. And then it led up to my debut where the game was on the line and I was, oh man, I was the most uncomfortable I've ever been in my life, but I was so used to that. It was almost comfort. Yeah. Um, uh, like now in the off season, I'm, I get so bored because it's just like a, I have to find something to make myself uncomfortable so I can feel comfortable. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. It's kind of messed. It's really messed up, but um, I, I don't know. It's just like going into the gym and seeing people you don't know and kind of going in there and working out. That's uncomfortable for anybody, but that's like my comfort zone is just not knowing what's going to happen. And just like the minor leagues, like you said, like not knowing if you're going to be demoted, promoted, every day is different. You never, you can't make any plans. Like it's just uncomfortable your whole lifestyle, but, that's what we live and that's that's the way it is. Yeah, cool. So we'll get to the debut in just a second, but the minor league process is a grind and like you didn't you didn't make your debut until 2017, which is a little bit older, like you were a little bit older for a lot of people making their MLB debut. So when you were going through the, throughout the minor leagues and you kind of have this constant grind of wanting to make it, wanting to make it, wanting to make it, did you ever set like a deadline for yourself? Like if I'm not here by this age, then I'm going to stop or what did that look like for you? Yeah. Um, you know, my dad asked me that when I got drafted in 2013, he's like, man, you know, what's your, what's your timeline? Like you got to set a time. If you don't make it to the big leagues by that time, like, cause he knew that I was, and I could be successful outside of baseball. You know, I could go get a job if I wanted to and stuff. And I was like, you know, I think I'm going to give myself to 27. If I don't make it by 27, I'm going to going to call it. And so 2017, I made my debut July 30th at 26. I turned 27 August 17th. So <laughs> oh I remember my gosh. that. Yeah, so I remember that every day. Um that like man, this I'm getting close. Like I got to do something about it. Like I got to do something. And so Right when I, I was, and my dad, I called my dad and you know, like he told me about it. And I was, I told him about him getting called up. He was like, man, you gave yourself, you were about two weeks, two weeks coming up. I was like, yeah, I know. It was pretty crazy. So um, I did give myself a timeline and that, and um, so I didn't want to, that grind is a tough grind for anybody for that long. I mean, and I was an older debut. Um, so, but I mean, I wasn't given the ability like something like a, like a Soto who's playing for the Nationals or a Bryce Harper who signed out of high school. I wasn't given those talents, God given talent that they have. And um, so I had to, you know, I had to grind through it. I reached every level and had to beat every level. And that was what got me there. Yeah. So I think it's crazy that it was that close to turning 27 is when you made your debut, debut and having how you set that as your deadline kind of when you first got drafted. So I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but – I find that a lot of times when setting goals and stuff, setting that deadline gives you that sense of urgency to make sure you complete it by then. Do you think 
that had any factor in it maybe taking a little bit longer? Like, do you think if you maybe said like 25 or 26, if there's any way you would have made it by then? I guess the real question is like, did you feel an extra sense of urgency and did you do anything different as it got close to that 27 years old? Um, you know, I, it's funny you say that because I'm, I'm a big believer in the law of attraction and um, I can go into that later if you want me to about it. But um, you're right. If I, if I had said it at 25, maybe I did, maybe I would have made it up by 25, but um, I didn't really do much to do it to till I'm 27. I just trusted the process. Honestly, like there were some failures in there, but that was part of the process. And that's the biggest thing about, minor league baseball is you have to trust the process. Like you have to trust what you're doing and what they're putting you in, because if you don't, if you question it, it's just going to bury you. And so, um, that was tough for me. Um, trusting the process in the beginning, but then I saw guys getting called up and watch what they did. They trusted the process and they would always tell me like, man, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Just trust it. And, um, so maybe if I was 25, and I threw that out in the universe and said, I'm going to make it by 25. Um, maybe the universe would have, you know, awarded me with that. But I gave, I started off saying 27 and that's what it was. And maybe, I mean, man, that's a good, I should have done it 25. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't know. I just thought it, I just thought it was interesting. And I, I think about that sometimes with my goals. Like I set a goal not too long ago to increase my podcast ratings and reviews to go from like 60 to 150. And I think it was two months or maybe two, three months. And I literally got to 150 the day the, the day I set the deadline. And I was like, if I had would have said like 200, would I have gotten to 200? You know, it was just like crazy that I got to the yeah, 150 yeah, on yeah. the day. But it's funny if, if you, if you over it, like, it, it is what it is, man. Like you, you, th you put it out there and that's what you want. And the universe was like, we're going to do this. But it's funny how, like, if you throw something out there, that you want it's crazy the amount of stuff that you do to get that yeah you know, know. like um if you like golly i'm it has to do with my debut if you want to talk about that but like go for it go you for go it. on with what you gotta ask but like i'll talk I, okay so um the year was 2017 when i made my debut and i was i got sent back to double a for the third year in a row and i was getting close to the point of like coming close to quitting. Like I said, I gave myself till I was 27. And um, it was probably, I think, it was like May, middle of May. I was back in AA, back in Tulsa for the third year, and I was miserable. I was doing terrible. I was hitting bad. I was like a bad human being, had a bad attitude. And I went in the batting cage after I went like 0 for 4 in a game, went to the batting cage, started hitting off the tee, trying to figure out my swing and stuff. And um, our hitting coach, Tramel Sled, she was now the assistant hitting coach for the Cubs, um, called me in. He came in there and he was like, put the bat down, like, put it down. Um, nothing's wrong with your swing. We watch as much video as you want. Nothing's wrong with your swing. And so he sat me down. It's like, I want you to go home and read about the law of attraction. I'm like, all right. And he asked me, he's like, what do you want out of this? Like, do you want to go? Do you believe you're a big leaguer? Like, do you honestly believe you're a big leaguer? And I was like, yeah, I do. He's like, I don't think you believe it because you're not, your attitude's awful and you just don't trust yourself. So I went home, read about the law of attraction and read about it, watched videos on YouTube, watch Will Smith talk about it, watch Jim Carrey talk about it. And pretty much what it said was, if you, like, if you see it in your mind, you'll feel it in your hands. Or if you throw it out there, what you want, if you truly believe it, it will come to you because your mind is so powerful that it'll do whatever it has to take to get there. So we had an off day the next day. Then we went to Northwest Arkansas to play the double A against double A team for the Royals. And man, I went off. I went like four for five every day. I was Texas league player of the week. And, but I had a baseball that I wrote a number two on. And I told myself, I want to get two hits the game or get on base twice. And I put it at the top of my locker and I looked at it every day while I was on this hot streak. And like I saw that too, and I had to get on base twice or get a hit twice or two RBIs or something like that. So I got named Texas League Player of the Week. And then I go to AAA. They call me to AAA. I tear it up. I'm like hitting like 320, 330 or something like that for like a, maybe three weeks. And so I'm driving, 
driving to get breakfast one morning. My AAA manager calls me. I have no idea. Like I never thought that I'd be called up. I thought I was going to get like a September call up and hopefully at the end of the year. So I'm driving and he calls me. He's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm just going to get some breakfast. What's up? Because you need, you need to turn around. You're going to LA. You're going to the big leagues. And I do. I, I like, I stopped the car. I like started bawling, crying. Um, call my dad, call my wife. My wife was actually in our house right now, like going over floor plans with my mom. So I called them on speaker and they went berserk and, uh, call my grandmother, called everybody. And then I was at the airport and I called Tramel Sledge who pretty much saved my career because he, he taught me this stuff. And I told him I was going to the big leagues and he started bawling, crying. He was like, man, that's like, that's the reason why I coach. Like you're the first guy that I've talked about about and it's worked. I, he was like, I wish everybody could, could really put that into their lives. And like, if they want it really bad, they can get it if they trust the process and they trust themselves and if they really work hard. And um, it was amazing that that, that that happened to me. And then even crazier when I, in that game, when I made, when I got that hit, Kike Hernandez, it was like the eighth inning and he looked at me and he says, you're going to win this game for us tonight. Because it was like a tie ball game. He's like, you're going to win this game for us tonight. And going back, and I was like, damn, a lot of attraction. Yeah, that's it's probably going to happen. Because he just oh said it. God. And it happened, man. And it's – and it's because and it, he got interviewed after the game, and he said that. And he was like, yeah, I told him he was going to win it. It was his night, and it was. And um, It was pretty – it was pretty wild how I – I learned so much about the mind and learned about how if you want to, if you really truly want something and you just got to say it out loud or write it down somewhere and just, cause it's going to happen. Like, it will happen if you really truly want it to. Oh my gosh. When you're two at two points, I got the chills. When you said uh, that the name of the coach, I forget his name off the top of my head, but you said the name of the coach called you. Yeah. yeah. When he called you, I was like, Oh my gosh. Or when you called him, I was like, that's awesome. And then uh, yeah, yeah. when the in the eighth inning, when he told you that you're going to get the game winning hit. So to per, kind of break down that that day a little bit. So you were called up on I think it was July 28th, and then two days later on the 30th is when you actually get into the game for the first point. So you guys are playing the San Francisco Giants, and it's the bottom of the 11th inning, and you're down two to one. I think wasn't the person before you got intentionally walked. Yeah, so Corey Seager got a double. Right. Someone got out. So there was one out, run on second, and Justin Turner was coming up. They intentionally walked Justin Turner to put the um, go-ahead run on first, which we don't normally do, but I've never gotten a major league at bat before. Say, so at what point then did you know you were going to go in? Like, when, like, were they starting to say, tell you that you were going to go in if they got intentionally walked? At what point did you know? Well, the, the pitcher spot was coming up, so they had to hit for the pitcher, and I was the last guy on the bench, so I knew that I was going to hit in that order before the inning even started. So all I needed was someone to get on base and see you got the, see you got the double. Then Dave Roberts, our manager, called me and was like, hey, you're hitting the spot. I was like, all right, here we go. And um, so I saw Turner get walked, so I was like, oh, man, I'm up. And so I – I get in the batter's box and they announce me making his major league debut, uh, Kyle Farmer. And so, and then I, I kind of like got in the batter's box and dug in and I looked out and I was like, holy crap, I'm here. Like I looked back and Buster Posey was catching and I was like, holy crap, man. Like it was kind of like a, a scene out of like rookie of the year, you know, when Henry Rowan Gardner comes in and he like looks in around the stands and um, that's what I kind of felt like. And um, so I got, yeah, it was crazy. And I didn't really – I wasn't really thinking much because when you get in the batter's box, you just kind of have to go with it. Right. And um, so I, I got down 0-2. Um, first pitch was a ball, but he called it a strike. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and so I worked the count to 3-2 and I got the hit. And I was so fortunate enough to hit the ball down the right field line because I could see it the entire way. So I made contact with it. And I saw it go the entire way and I hit, I was like, Holy shit. I like, I'm, I'm running. And so I was running, running around first, running on second. I didn't think that they were going to send Justin Turner. So I thought I'd tied, I, I knew I tied the game, but I didn't think they were going to send him. And so I round second base and all of a sudden I see a big white wall of players 
just running towards me. And I didn't know what to do. Like I'd never really done that before. So I like threw my helmet off. My best friend, Alex Wood, roommate in college, comes and sprints and tackles me. Um, Puig is grabbing my jersey, ripping it off. And then all of a sudden I'm like getting up and like the stands are going insane. Like I've whew. and supposedly they were chanting, let's go, Kyle. But I didn't I didn't hear anything. Um and so I, I get back and forget that it's Sunday night baseball. It was a Sunday night baseball game. And so they're like, Hey, sports center wants to interview. I was like, what? <laughs> no way. So like, I'm like, let's do it. And I get Gatorade dumped on me, whatever. And so it was so funny. I put the headset on and I've watched sports center every day for my entire life. And it was so cool hearing a voice. I was like, dude, I know what you look like. Like, this is, <laughs> like I watch you all the time. And, uh, it was so cool. I, um, and like that stuff never, never has really happened to me. And um, it just goes back to like, you know, you create your own luck. I mean, baseball's, I mean, it's a lot of luck goes into baseball. You know, you got to have the, the right opportunity at the right time. Um, but, you know, I believe in you create your own luck and you create your own opportunities. And that opportunity was, was created probably in double A when I was struggling and, and, you know, Tremel Sledge caught, caught me off to the side and, and that that moment was probably created two months prior to that and uh which i thought was pretty cool gosh that's so that just honestly is like the coolest moment ever i, I watched uh that youtube there's like a 12 minute youtube video that kind of recounts the whole thing from you being called up um all the way to that to the finish there with you being interviewed on sports center and i watched it and just got the chills a few times with you got, and then you going back underneath the stadium and and hugging your parents and and jeff urban and some of those guys yeah um that was just like the coolest thing ever well was when i when i got to see my dad after it because man or my parent both my parents my mom and my dad they had they had gone through through so much for me you know my entire life and my sister um summer ball summer ball games driving me everywhere my dad coaching me throughout my whole entire life and and just having that, having them there for that moment was like, it was more for them than for me because they had put so much of their time and effort into it my entire life. Like for the past 26 years, they had put everything they had into me. And, but if I didn't want to do it, I didn't have, they didn't, they wouldn't have cared, but they did care and they wanted me to do what I loved and they pushed me. And without them, I mean, it was, I mean, there's no telling where I would, where I would be. And, um, you just you think of a lot about the t- tough times and the good times when something good happens to you, and like there were so many memories that rushed in my mind after that that my parents had gone through with me. That was pretty cool. Yeah, gosh, this is just like such a cool story and cool moment. It's like I don't even know where to go from here. But since we have to go somewhere uh, afterwards, like obviously awesome day, probably amazing. You know, probably feel that great moment for a few days. What's kind of next? What were you like most excited about moving forward? Um, oh, good question. I was, you know, I was the next, the next road trip. My first road trip was coming back to Atlanta. We played the Braves right. uh, for my first road trip. The following night we flew back to Atlanta. So I was like, Holy moly, this couldn't be, this could be awesome. And so I was pumped about that. Like that was awesome. Um, cause I looked at the schedule a long time ago and saw that, that they were playing the Braves in Atlanta at this time. I was like, man, that'd be so cool if I could be there for that series. And I was, and so that was cool. And then the biggest moment was we'd gotten done in September and we, we made the playoffs and I knew there was possibly a chance that I was to make the playoff roster. And if you make the playoff roster, that's a huge deal. And so we were in, in LA practicing after the season got over with him. Dave Roberts came over to me and said, Hey, you made the 25 man roster for the playoffs. And I was like, oh, what? Like I was just hoping for a September call up three months ago. Um, and he was like, yeah, you made the playoffs. We're going to carry three catchers. And I was like, dang, that's awesome. And you know, that was incredible because I played in the NL, NLDS, NLCS didn't make the roster for the, for the world series, but I got to travel with the team and um, didn't play much in either one of those series, but I pinch hit, got a, got a sacrifice fly against the Cubs in the championship series and the championship game, um, which was really cool. And like, 
that was that was surreal because I was playing in Wrigley Field in the playoffs. I had watched it my entire life, watching, you know, Bartman mess up that ball and down the line in, in Chicago. And I was, you know, part of history. And um, I grew up loving baseball. And if you love baseball and you're in that situation, it's like you could die after that and say and lived a great life, you know. I mean, it was – uh, it was pretty incredible. That So that was probably the biggest moment past that moment. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So I'm going to backtrack a little bit um, to kind of growing up, younger days in, in high school and stuff. So like we talked about earlier, there's so many people chasing after the goal and the dream of becoming a major league baseball player. A ton of people in high school, a ton of people in college, a ton of people in minor leagues. What do you think maybe are some of the things that you did in high school, in college, in minor leagues that set you apart from other people that gave you the ability to get called up on uh, July 28th, 2017. Um, Yeah. You know, I think um, what I did differently than other people was I, I kind of, there was two things. I stayed positive. I tried to stay positive as much as I could. Um, no matter the situation, where I was in, where I was staying, what level I was at. Um, the mind, like I said before, is a, is a powerful thing. And if you're negative about anything, it's going to bury you. And I tried not to bury myself. You know, I, I tried to stay positive. I, I always look at the glass half full, um, try to bring them, make the most out of every, every situation you're in. Um, but also, I, I came to the field every day trying to get better at something. Um, I tried to get better, whether it was a small thing like um, fielding ground balls or or hitting more home runs or something like that. Like I always I tried to get better each day. I I still am watching videos of guys, learning more things about guys. And and I just I I was like a nerd for the game. Like I was a nerd for like the game, for working hard, for working out. Like I was always out there for early work, like no matter if I was playing that day, I wasn't playing that day. I think guys get caught up in like, yeah, rest is important, but there's a certain time where you can rest, but there's a certain time where you can work too. And, um, I, I never gave up. Like I wanted to, but I had guys like sledge who was around me to not let me get up, give up. And I think that's another thing. If you really, like, if you truly want something, never give up because it can happen. Like it's going to happen for you. No matter, no matter how big the goal is or how large it is, it's going to happen. If you truly want it, you will put your mind and effort into it. And I think that's, that's what saved me. And I think that's what saved, like in high school, I, like, I don't know. I just, I was kind of, I just wanted to get better. I wanted to, I was never the fastest. I was never the strongest. I was usually pretty chunky. Like I was just, I played left guard in seventh grade. They put me at left guard. Nam Bennigan put me at left guard. <laughs> and I ended up playing quarterback. Yeah. So like. Yeah, man, I was thrown into a lot of situations, but like, I was like, I'm not going to, like, so what? I'm going to keep going. Like, it's all right. But I think, like, I look at my friends in high school now and they're doing what they love, but I, I was in a different world. I was in a different atmosphere. I was in, like, I was in my own world when I, I knew what I wanted to do. And so I, I nothing was going to get in my way of doing it. And that's, that's helped me here. That's helped me through everything that I've done is like, I've just told myself that like, I don't, I don't care what people think. I mean, like, that's the biggest thing. People get caught up in so much of, of what people think of themselves, what people think of each other. Like who cares what they think, do what you got to do to get it done and just respect them, respect their opinion. But it doesn't matter what they say. Like, like, who, like what someone's going to tell me I can't do it. Like, no, I mean, I can, I know I can do it. Mm-hmm. So go do it. You know, and that's, that's what my dad says. Go do it, do it. If you want to do it, do it. And so that's like, that's my motto. I love it. I love it. I remember that. I remember all the coaches love telling that story in high school that Kyle Farmer was left guard in seventh grade because <laughs> they would always tell everybody like, you never know, keep working hard and you never know what's possible. I mean, I was left guard in strong corner <laughs> and I didn't know, like I was so pissed that, I didn't even learn any of the blocks. So I would ask the tackle next to me, like, hey, man, which way are we going? 
<laughs> uh, yeah, I was so mad. I was like, freaking Nam Bennigan put me at left guard. Unbelievable. Oh my gosh, that's hysterical. But like I would stay after practice and like throw bombs to receivers, like just throw. And they're like, why aren't you quarterback? I was like, well, we don't throw. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's, just, that's too funny. Um, so going into, it could be anything going into the minor leagues or could be going into major leagues. Was there anything that you didn't expect that kind of threw you off guard about the game or about what goes on or anything about going to the minor leagues or the major leagues that you didn't expect that, that caught you off guard? Yeah, um, I was expecting um, like a lot of structure in the minor leagues and, and even in the major leagues, but um, like coming from college, you know, you have a structure, you have classes, then you go to practice and you go to study hall. Um, and then you go to the minor leagues and it's like, be on time. Like it's your, it's your life, man. If you don't want to come, you don't have to come, but like, it's your life. Like it was more of a, it was like a life changing event because that's life. Like it's a job. Um, and people treated it like a job. Like, be on time, um, do what you got to do to get better. And then you can go home and then we'll play, you know, play a game and we'll go home. And I was like, damn, like, this is like, like, we're not playing for like an SEC championship. We're playing to like get to the big leagues. Like this is like a, it's almost like selfish, but, but like a team game now where like, you got to do what you got to do to make it. Like he, that guy, that guy on the mound trying to take money, trying to take money from you. But you got to take money from him. Like, you know, like that's, it was like cutthroat where in college, you know, you're playing as a team to make it to the world college world series, but in the minor leagues, you're making it to get to the big leagues and that it almost was a selfish, but unselfish game. You know, you still wanted your team to do well, but you got to get your numbers and you got to do good to make it. Gotcha. So you got traded to, what did you get? What was the, what year did you get traded to the Reds? It was just last year. I, I got, traded last year in December. Right. It was um, me, Alex Wood, Yasiel Puig, and Matt Kemp got traded to the Reds. Okay, gotcha. So what what was that experience of going through a trade like? Um, in September of last year, I wasn't playing much with the Dodgers. And so I went up to our GM, Andrew Friedman, and um, great guy. I had a great relationship with him. And um, I was like, man, you know, if you don't have any, if you don't have any plans for me next year, I'd like to get traded. Like if there's an opportunity for me to get traded, I would like to do it. And he's like, well, you know, you're such a great asset to this team. And, um, but if the opportunity arises, I'll, I'll respect you and, and I'll, I'll trade you if, it, if it's a great opportunity for yourself. I'm like, all right. And, um, so I'm driving down to, down to Valdosta, Georgia to meet my, to not meet, but to go to Christmas with my wife down in her family, down with her family. And, um, get a call. Hey Kyle, you've been traded to the Reds, you know, thanks for everything you've done. And I was like, okay, Dodgers are gone. And so I thought I was going to be a, just like a one-on-one trade. I didn't know I was going to be part of a blockbuster trade like that. And it was funny because going back to the, like the law of attraction, I kind of was joking around saying like, I'm going to be the best part of this trade. Like I'm going to like, I'm going to be the best part. And um, so Alex got traded, my best friend, which was really cool. But he got he was hurt the whole year, which sucked. Um, Yasiel Pui got traded. Matt Kemp got released. And so I was like kind of like the main stay in that trade, which was pretty cool. But I wish that Alex hadn't, hadn't gotten hurt because he probably would have been. But um, it was awesome because I, I got to stay up the whole year. Um, got a great ton of playing time and great experience and learned a lot. And, um, yeah, I was just, I mean, I love the Dodgers and everything they did. It's a great organization, but I, I wanted to play more for myself and it was a great opportunity for me. Yeah. So with having played or with having gotten so much good playing time this past year, what do you think is maybe your number one takeaway from the season because you got so much more playing time? <sighs> um, you know, I, I learned a lot. But the main thing I learned was you have to, whether it's in baseball or it's in life, if you want something to gain something, you got to sacrifice something. So there was times where, you know, if I wanted to do well in baseball, I had to sacrifice some time with my wife. But if I wanted 
some time with my wife, I had to sacrifice some baseball stuff, like going to the field early, going to the field a little bit later. Um, it's, it's, uh, it was kind of tough. And, but I learned that, learned how to be patient and learn how, I mean, every day I learned how to accept failure because every day I failed, like everybody fails every day. And, um, that's the biggest thing that I had to do. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool. So, The reason, the reason I do this podcast or the people that I bring on, I believe have done a very good job up to this point in their life of getting closer to the best version of, of themselves. And like I said, I've seen great success in doing so. So what I want to ask for you is if there are, what do you think are maybe three things that you've done really well in your life? And we've might, may probably already touched on a few, but what are maybe three things that you've done in your life really well that have allowed you to get to this point? in terms of your journey to closer to the best version of yourself? Man, um, okay. One, uh, I've, I've said a million times, um, I've learned how to accept failure and learn from it. Like if I hadn't done that, um, I probably wouldn't be playing baseball. Yeah. Um, that's the toughest thing. Um, two, is I think learning how to create, like learning how to create opportunities for yourself through hard work and preparation. Um, I think that if you, like I said, you know, you create your own luck and the only reason why you create your own luck is through working hard and staying positive and staying humble um, because you look at some guys that, have had some bad luck, but if you look in their, their past, you know, maybe they've been a little cocky, maybe, maybe they've been a little negative. Um, and third, probably taking ownership of my mistakes and taking ownership of my successes. Um, I think when you take ownership and your failures and, and taking ownership of stuff bad happening to you, I think that opens up the world to greater opportunities. Like, I'll give you a little stupid example. Like, so how many times have you been mad that you've caught like a yellow light and then it's turned red, like back to back times? Like, dang, man, this always happens to me. I'm in a rush. But if you take ownership of it, like, man, maybe I shouldn't have taken a 10 minute shower. I, this probably would have never happened. It like makes you feel so much better about it. Like, man, it wasn't the unit, it wasn't that person's fault. It was my own fault. Like, I did that. And I've learned how to do that the past maybe a year and a half and I'm still working on it to this day. Um, I still, you know, have been very impatient sometimes and I, I, I catch myself doing it. Like when you catch yourself, you'll catch yourself being impatient. You'll catch yourself doing it more and more if you take ownership of it. And um, I think that's helped me out a lot with being patient with other people and, and stuff like that. It's just taking ownership of, of your failures and your successes. I really like that last one because I think that, and I really liked the seemingly trivial example that you brought up because I think a lot of people, it does give you patience and it does give you, because if you take ownership and responsibility for something, then you can then actually go do something about it. Because if you don't take ownership for it, then you can't do anything to make it better the next time. But if you take that responsibility, then you realize it's like, okay, I can do something different to make sure that doesn't happen the same way again. So I think that was really cool. Exactly. That's, that's a, that's perfect. That, that's what, that's what I've battled with every day, but I mean, life's a battle and, and to make it easier, you just got to keep working. Yeah. Well, Kyle, I want to acknowledge you because I think that being patient and kind of embracing the journey and learning from your failures um, is one of the hardest things for people to do and to trust the process. I really like that phrase. I think that's one of the hardest things for all of us to do, especially now when, you know, you see everybody's overnight successes on social media or online and everything like that when it never truly was that overnight success. People put in the work for years and years and years leading up to it. But for you to be able to have that patience and have the ability to trust the process, I think it's really cool. And it's obviously panned out uh, really well for you back in 2017 and it continues to to this day. So I want to acknowledge you for your ability to be able to trust the process. I think it's awesome. I appreciate it. Thank you.
Well, I want to make sure everybody can go support you as, as best as possible. So make sure that you stay tuned for next MLB season. Uh, hopefully to see Kyle on, uh, in a Cincinnati Reds uniform playing any position. <laughs> um, and then you can go anywhere. Follow. You never know when. Right, exactly. You can go follow him on Instagram at, it's just at Kyle Farmer, right? Yeah, like Kyle underscore underscore farmer, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, you'll be tagged uh, in the video and uh, on social media and everything like that, too. So people will know where to find you. Well, basically, the last question is I, bec- I believe becoming the best version of yourself is a constant journey. And I bring people on who I feel like have done a really good job up to this point in their life and I've seen great success and who are constantly trying to improve every single day and cont- continually trying to chase down the best version of themselves. If there are three things that you could currently do or currently work on to get closer to that best version of Kyle Farmer, what are those three things that you could currently do or currently work on? Dang. Golly. (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah. uh, Everything, I guess. I mean, everything. No. Um, (laughs) Gosh. I hadn't even thought about that. I need to think about that. Um, I probably, you know, I can always be a better husband. Um, I can do more for my wife as, I mean, I try and do as much as I can, but, uh, you know, that relationship, you know, marriage is a, it's a grind, but you know, you're marrying your best friend and and she is my best friend. And so I have to, you know, get better at that. And every day we, you know, we get better and better. Um, you know, I think I'm kind of going against what I said, but I almost care too much about people um to where i put people other people sometimes in front of myself and i probably should do a better job of not doing that as much and starting to care more about what i have to get done because i do care about what i have to get done but i can care more about i can care more about myself and i I hate saying this but i do because i i do care about other people but there comes a point in time where you got to get what's what's yours and I have to do a better job of focusing like, like this, like you just asked me a question. I didn't know how to answer it. Like I have to get better at knowing how I can get better at myself, Mm -hmm. you know, know? like that's the toughest, that's the toughest thing for me. Um, and three, oh man, (laughs) like, look at this. (laughs) <laughs> right there. He, he's he's listening uh but i don't know man that's a good question i need to think about that if you if you call me back in two weeks i can probably have an answer for you all right but all the right. second one is probably my biggest thing yeah no and i like that I, you know you that second one you kind of danced around a little bit but i think that one's like a i think it's a really powerful one and i think it's something that a lot of people need to think about and need to realize like, am I prioritizing myself enough and the things that I want to get done and the things that I need to get done? Yeah. I don't, I don't take a lot of me time. I think that people have to take a lot of me time to, to, to better their lives. Um, cause I'm always on the go. I'm always looking for something to do. And I never have time to think about what's best for myself. And, um, cause I'm always thinking about other people except during baseball season when I'm in a whole completely different world. Like I have a mohawk, I have a different hair, my facial hair. Like I'm in it. I'm in it. I'm in the woods. I'm fighting, you know, but no, I'm <laughs> um, but that, yeah. I love, I love it. Dude. It's a well, different world. I love it. Well, I appreciate it, Kyle. That's all we got, man. Well, thank you. I appreciate you having me.